Hi guys, this is Janet. I have Rosie Chang with me here on Living Room Talks. Rosie, tell me a little bit about yourself. Thanks for inviting me. I um, started at the University of Pittsburgh um, for my undergraduate degree and then went out to San Jose State University and worked out there for a few years. Um, after I graduated, I did some rotations at some division one schools because I decided, you know, a high school setting wasn't where I wanted to, to practice. Um, I was able to get a head athletic trainer's position out in Keystone College in um, La Plume, Pennsylvania. And that's where I'm originally from is Pennsylvania. So it was nice to come home. Um, after working there for about two years, I was offered a position at the University of San Francisco where I continue to work. Um, for about three years um, before deciding to leave Division I altogether in um, about, I'm in my ninth season at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, I'm the coordinator of student athlete health and wellness um, and a staff athletic trainer there. Um, my a large focus of, of my job description over there is I run a program, our sports medicines assessment of risk tendencies, and I'm the liaison for our peer-to-peer -peer health and wellness advocate group, or PLAvocates. And that program primarily does um, education and intervention for nutrition, substance abuse, mental health, and sexual assault and dating violence. Um, and we educate our student athletes every year on all of those topics. And then I am the point person for any student athletes that are um, having issues in any of those um, areas. And we, we make sure that they get to the resources that um, are needed in order for them to continue to, to get better and, and be um, productive student athletes. With current events right now, and obviously this pandemic, what are some of the issues your student athletes are facing? I think the biggest issue right now is um, being motivated um, to practice when we don't have any clear idea of when we're actually going to compete. Um, and the current climate, we are, the university itself is pretty diverse. Um, we do have a small um, minority athletic student athlete population. And we have been having a lot of conversations on um, how we can be more inclusive within our department, not just our university and within our teams. Um, student athletes are um, being more vocal, which is really nice. Um, they feel that there is a safe place for them. Um, with a couple of the staff members, uh, myself included, um, have been um, really open to wanting to hear their stories and encouraging them to talk and even encouraging our staff um, to talk. So we, we have that open dialogue, which is nice. And we're trying to, it's gonna, we know it's a long road ahead to, to change the culture in our athletic department, but we are willing and we're ready to, to take it head on. Tell me a little bit about the panel you were part of a little while ago. What was your role and what did you get out of it? Yeah, absolutely. Our Plavocates, our peer-to-peer -peer health and wellness group decided um, the week of the NCAA, I think it was division three awareness um, and diversity and inclusion um, week, uh, the staff, we had a panel of staff members, there was five of us, um, and it was together we rise and we wanted to each tell our story. And the Plavocates really wanted to highlight that diversity and inclusion just isn't about race and ethnicity, that it includes the LGBTQ community, that it's gender and equity, um, religion. Um, so there were two of us that were minority members, um, our women's softball head softball coach who was black, myself, um, and then we had two coaches that were um, are part of the LGBTQ community and one staff member who is raising two black sons um, and is a female in sports information, um, which was a hard field for females when she started um, her career as a female was, she was one of, very few women in that field. Um, so we each told our story um, and then we left it open for Q&A. 
Um, we actually ran out of time. Um, we had, we did it via Zoom as a webinar and we had about 35 members, um, student athletes and staff members, coaches join us um, as the audience. And um, the feedback has been great. Um, very supportive of our student athletes have been very supportive. Um, you know, I've gotten messages from some of our Asian female student athletes, um, which was nice that they, they feel that they have a face on our staff um, that looks like them. Tell me a little bit about your story that you told to this panel. Yeah, so it was really the first time I told my story um, to a large group. Um, so it was really difficult to be that vulnerable. Um, I talked about how I grew up in a very large family. Um, my parents immigrated from Hong Kong, so first generation. Um, we were low income. So there was a lot of struggles um, to get into college, to pay for college. Um, and then going through my career, um, realizing, you know, as I kind of reflected for this panel for some of the questions was a lot of the positions I felt like that I wasn't getting, um, that I was up, you know, the top two or three candidates for the position and I was losing out um, to predominantly white males, um, that it was more of, it was maybe more gender and race because I was qualified or just as qualified or more qualified than the, the individuals that were um, given those positions. So um, and it, it wasn't just one time, it happened at different organizations, different universities, different you know, levels from division one to the division three. Um, so it made me start to realize and rethink like, I never really thought race was a barrier. Um, and I still don't, maybe it is and I think it's more of me being a Asian female and not being the stereotypical Asian female of being quiet and reserved and um, you know subservient where I'm more outspoken and honest and you know um, and I, I was told at one point that one of my negative traits was I was too outspoken and um, and it's, it's, I was just, I'm just being honest, right? So I feel like if a male was being honest, that's how they would describe him. Whereas a female is described as outspoken or combative. Um, and using a lot of those negative terms to describe female traits or women with those traits, but describing men in a more positive light. And I think we've seen it across the board, not just in athletics, in, um, in athletic training, but I think women, in every career has been told that them being a good leader, what they, they define as a good leader as a female is not the same. Um, you know, they, they're challenging and, um, you know, they, they challenging authority and, you know, not being a team player when it's really, we're just, we're just trying to make our organizations better by speaking our mind and being honest. Um, and we are penalized for that, I feel like. How does that make you feel when these instances happen? Yeah, it, it makes me really angry um, and disappointed that we haven't come very far um, at all and um, frustrated, I think. Um, it is, is really, you know, this, this summer, um, I really had time to think about it and, you know, I was upset and sad and again, a lot of self-doubt, but then talking to other female colleagues, it was more of, I'm angry now because I am more than qualified to have these positions and there isn't any reason that I shouldn't be offered these positions at this point. With this, these feelings, how do you maintain your mental wellness? So I, I talk to my friends a lot, um, which I think is good, and I don't bottle it up. Um, I have a really great support system, um, exercising, going for walks, um, and long bike rides, I think, has really helped. Um, I do try meditation. Meditation is really hard for me, so I can only do it three 
to four minutes at a time before my mind starts to wander. Um, but I, I just sometimes just sitting by myself um, really just calms me and just kind of working through things myself seems to help. Knowing that there are these feelings or perceptions about Asian female athletic trainers, how do you stay motivated as an athletic trainer? I, I always do what's in the best interest of my student athletes. And that is what I focus on, um, making sure that they are getting the best care that I can provide and getting them to the resources that they need um, in order to be, um, to succeed, not just as a student athlete, but just as a human um, and as a person. And knowing that college is a bubble and the real world is, is way harsher and getting them to understand that there are resources and there's coping mechanisms that you can learn now that are gonna bring you, you know, and help you through the stressful times in your career when you leave college. Um, you know, I, I have thought about leaving athletic training several times um, and what does keep me motivated is the student athletes. So a little bit more about yourself. Tell me about an embarrassing moment you've had as an athletic trainer. Oh, geez. So I guess the most embarrassing moment that was caught on film was at a basketball game. And I always sit at the opposite end of the bench away from the players. And a player was going for a loose ball coming out of bounds. And she was coming right for me. And it was either, I, I didn't have enough time to move. So I just kind of, as she was coming, grabbed her and the chairs were chained together. So as we all went, all of the chairs went with us and we just kind of tumbled behind the bench. Um, and it was all caught on film, so yeah. I can always relive that moment. <laughs> and I'm sure right afterwards, everyone watched it on loop and, and nonstop. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> what kind of advice, what advice do you have for other athletic trainers during these trying times? I think just um, having a good support system and talking about what you're going through um, because we're all going through the same things and normalizing it, I think is really important, especially with the pandemic and um, the racial, racial tensions that are going on right now um, and taking care of yourself first, which is always the hardest thing for us to do. Um, but taking five or 10 minutes to kind of take a deep breath and relax because we'll get through this, we always do, we're fighters. Um, but, you know, make sure you're leaving some time for yourself and for your family and knowing what's most important to you and kind of and focus on that. Rosie, the next couple of minutes is for you, your final statement. So I really appreciate um, you giving me the time to talk. I think this is um, a great opportunity um, for not only each one of us in our organizations to start making changes, um, but for us to start making changes, not only in our current settings, but also in our communities that we live in um, and, you know, the, the, the world, you know, um, I think this is a really good turning point for us. Um, and I think we should continue with the momentum um, and, you know, being uncomfortable and making people have these uncomfortable conversations is the only way that change is gonna happen. And we need to continue to push and push and ask the hard questions and have those hard conversations. Rosie, thank you so much for your time and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you.